We are at the Thumb Butte Distillery and we have Jim Bacigalupi. Jim is one of the owners, am I correct? Yes. One of the owners. My wife uh, and I wife are the working and partners. This whole building was my art studio uh, back about nine years ago. And my girlfriend at the time said, let's be ahead of the curve for once. Let's be a distillery. And I said, that's crazy. I don't know anything about it at all. She kept saying, uh, this is a good idea and we only need half the building. Oh. Okay, so fast forward nine years. Right. Uh, the girlfriend's my wife. Right. And we're in the whole building. Yeah. <laughs> and we're still in business. So right. she was right. I read a lot. I listened to people who knew a lot more than I did. Okay. I was lucky to have some mentors. Okay. One at the moment uh, lives in Canada and is a, is a major... Um, guy who sets up distilleries around the world and ah. he's always at my beck and call in case I have a question cool which makes that, it that neat so that I'm a mentor like that following uh, following a, a thread online you can be dangerous yeah and um, usually not you know successful so it's it's been lucky I've I've had some very knowledgeable people okay. Uh, okay. including uh, Dwight, a good old boy in Tennessee who, who was a uh, distiller there, uh -huh. and um, so he's he's helped us as well. So they helped you on the whiskey end, on the bourbon On the end. whiskey end, you bet. Yeah, so, and there's a lot to that all by itself. Oh, still learning every day. We come from an, an art background. Sure. So uh, experimentation is just part of our nature. Being satisfied not just in being a production line and with full knowledge that we can't compete with the huge labels in volume, but mm -hmm. we can certainly compete with anyone in quality. And so that's why we enter the international shows every year. Right. And we're up against you pick a label. We, you know, they they are they enter these shows every year because sure. uh, the little guys want to look big, and right. now the big guys want to look little. You took in some outside partners to to be able to lift your business up financially. Am I correct on that? Yes. I first hit my college buddies for their money. Okay. And after we that only, so yeah, only goes so far. Right. Well, it's I think it's good for people to know because. Uh, businesses like this are not just driven by retail customers, but they're driven by other businesses who want to get the product and will buy the product in more volume. They have the ability to not only make the product, but to make volume of product because they've got the, they've got the financial wherewithal to be able to knock that out. You still had to have some kind of driving want, even though you said that'd be a great idea to do a distillery. It'd be like being a chef. I mean, you got to do it every day and you got to deal with it. So what makes you love doing this? Because you obviously do. Well, as you know, as I say, um, Dana and I were artists. Uh, yeah. My whole life, I was an artist. Uh, yeah. Built furniture and cast glass and uh, metal fabrication. Right. So experimentation and delving into unknown materials and areas is not not so new. It's just Making yeah. another product same. in a new medium. It's just uh, the, the same the same space in your heart and your head. Right. And it's just different materials. My primary responsibility is to make the raw materials and then our uh, our smart guys uh, turn it into some uh, liquid gold. Calling something scotch is a little derogatory. Could you explain that? Uh, it's not as much derogatory as it's uh, not accurate. Um, right. Okay. Right. That's the government is concerned that uh, and disallow us to put the word scotch on the bottle. Uh, the government uh, believes that we are advertising the fact that our single malt comes from Scotland, and of course it doesn't. Correct. Uh, now I have to say our barley comes from Scotland. Uh, as a result of Dana visiting two years ago, uh, had a okay. wonderful tour and met some great people. Okay. And so we, we switched the, the uh, brand of barley, the varietal itself. Mm -hmm. And we're now getting it uh, from a, the malt house that makes McCollum and Speyside and a lot of very famous Highland scotches. We're using the same barley. How does this product differ and what's, what would be a comparison of your, your product? Your product is called... We call it Crown King. And Crown that was King. not the original name. Oh, okay. We, we thought that Arizona Highland single malt would be tell about where we are and where we're from. However, the government disallowed us using the word Highland, okay. so we changed the name. Yeah. So we, we, uh, we'd like to use locale, different locales for our different names that, that are our Arizona sure. uh, type. So Crown King is a famous old mining town. First of all, single malt is called single because there's only one grain in single malt. Right, in right, right, it's 100% barley. It's 100% barley. All single malt is 100% right. barley. Bourbon would be a mixture. Uh, rye whiskey, uh, you know, can be a mixture, mm -hmm. but single malt has to be 100% barley. We do have folks coming in here with kilts on, so oh, all right. there's some very serious scotch drinkers. Right. Our forte is being able to make deeper cuts, as they say, in the product as it comes over the still, that we can put more of the good stuff in the bottle. 
since volume is not our primary moving moving force, we can use uh, the better part of the run and not have to put in the, the heads and the tails. That's the beginning of the run and the end of the run. So we, uh, that's, that's a very, very important major difference between a craft distillery and the other guys. Your next year's product could be slightly different. Oh, right? absolutely. But that's absolutely. not a problem. Batch to batch, people expect it. That's who you are, people expect it. They kind of yeah. want that. Consistency is very, very important in any business. Sure. So people begin to love our bourbon. Right, they want, uh, they want that They bourbon. want that bourbon. And right. so we uh, work very hard to consistently make the highest quality day after day, month after month, year after year. So yeah. We're all learning every day. No one's uh -huh. sitting back on their laurels here. We're studying every day, right. uh, reading, um, bouncing things off of my mentor in Canada. Ian Smiley, by the way, very well-known author in the field. Mm -hmm. We're always striving to be better, which doesn't mean that we have to give up a, a recognizable flavor. Our bourbon is popular. I can make it better, I believe. Yeah. Um, I'm just doing a couple things next week to tweak it, to m get more of the goodness out of the grain uh, and out of the processes, but uh, not necessarily changing the drastically the, the overall identifying flavor. We have special editions uh, oh. several times a year okay. in many of our different products. If we get a crazy idea that we want to mix coffee with vodka or okay. uh, we want to stick the gin in the rum barrel yeah. or some things like that, we can do a very, very small run and see what our customers like and then it went test, huh? test them out on the customers and then if it begins to move then then we can approach our distributor and see if they think the uh, retail vendors would be interested and so that's kind of how new products happen this is called a mash ton just imagine 400 pounds of grain 300 gallons of really really hot water and they'll right. be inside um, this is a rake and when it gets put back in it's turning around and around and basically we're starting by making a big bowl of porridge we're we're breaking it down what we're doing is we're melting the hot water is melting mother nature's starch okay. and so it's a it's a soupy starchy put your finger in it taste it kind of blah tasting okay. at first okay. and that's where we start okay so you're using barley and that as you just said was 100 it's 100 percent all barley and so distinguished for people who are watching this what malted barley means. Is there a process? Are you adding something or is it that way or what is it? Well, when I first heard the word malt, I, of course I thought of a milkshake or exactly, something like that. Exactly, chocolate malt. Yeah, right. right. Malting is a process. They germinate the seed. In other words, the barley seeds are on the floor of an old barn and they sprinkler it and they're coaxing the seed to grow some little uh, roots. And um, as they're doing that, Mother Nature's saying, you're gonna get big, you're gonna get big, you better start making those enzymes that's gonna help you get big and tall. Okay. And so the seed goes okay and starts making these enzymes. And then a man comes along and heats the barn and kills the seed before the, the shoots have, a, have a, a chance to start growing. But those enzymes are still inside each of those kernels. And that right. enzyme okay. is what's necessary and absolutely necessary to be in this process that allows me the distiller to convert that starchy water to sugar. So it's not anything you add or anything. It's just, it's in inherent. The seed. It's inherent. Okay. Yes. Now I, I can add some enzymes. There has to be a minimum, I believe, of four percent of right. your of your recipe of seeds that have to be malted. They have to contain those enzymes. Have you experimented with different levels yes. and percentages? I have. What, have you found any that any like a sweet spot? Or you don't have to say it if you don't want no, to, but I, no, I was just I, curious about that. I'm, I'm always experimenting. Uh, I guess the, the proof of the pudding is, does it turn to sugar? Um, and so... And how do you test that? There's a very old fashioned way. We, when we believe it's ready, and it only takes a half a day actually to do this cooking. Okay. We take out a little bit of the, what's called wort, and uh, we take a drop of iodine, drop that iodine in, into the liquid. And if the liquid stays in beautiful amber color, we know that it's almost pure sugar. If it turns purple, right? we know that there's still starch present. Really? And so our point is we're trying to convert the starch to sugar. Well, so you so can significantly We can see it. see it. We can right. see when it happens. That's so nice. we're not just relying on, oh, it's pretty sweet. And then, and then you do your test and if everything's good? Then we hook up our hoses and we pump the liquid out. The okay. grain stays behind. Okay. And we, we pump and we fill up our fermenters. So with you got some filters there that are keeping the stuff from coming in. Yes, this is a false bottom. So okay. the grain is, you know, stays behind and the liquid comes and rinses the sugars now that okay. used to be starch. Are you able to filter everything out pretty much the first time through? We try and rinse 
all the sugars out of the grain, leaving the grain behind. But in terms of filtering, filtering is a major, major, major part of what we do. Right. And, it, and it isn't always just about getting the fly specks out of the milk. It's, okay. it's about flavors and, and tastes as well. So you have to do a lot more filtering? Yes. I'd say any bottle that we have commercially available has seen some form of filtration at least eight times. This is one of our fermenters. Okay. Um, so our hoses have taken the sugar liquid and we've pumped it into our fermenter. Okay. And now we're going to add enzymes. We're going to add yeast, a very specific yeast that we've decided after experimentation that's giving us the flavor profile that we're looking for. Right, for this particular. For this very particular thing. And okay. Dana Murdoch, my wife, was a, her past life, she was a craft baker. Okay. And had her own bakery in Santa Barbara, California. Okay. And she knows yeast, so we call her the Yeastmeister. So okay. she is the one who really all helped kinds us. Of different yeast for people. Hundreds yeast and hundreds. Yeast hundreds, isn't yeast. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Right. So, um, and some are dry and some are liquid, but anyway, so we, we pick the one that we like. Okay, so that takes some time just to be able to nail that down. Yes, it does. You end up with a lot of throwaway. Uh, in the beginning, I have to say, lots of very valuable things went down the drain. <laughs> yeah, because you have <laughs> it's to. It's like, oh no, come back. Because you, you, you got a customer at the end of this process You're right, that's got to be satisfied. You're right. Oh, one I, question about that, just yeah. to step you back. Um, I'll use a car manufacturer as an example. The engineering department says, this is the best car part that we should put in here. Don't use these other vendors out there because they got a problem here, here, and there. Then it hits marketing and they're trying to position the car at a certain price. And then it hits accounting where they're definitely behind all that price stuff. And by the time it runs back to engineering, a different part's coming. I could see that the exact same process happening in any manufacturing process, including making things like this. You have an advantage being a smaller distillery because you don't have to make those product mistakes. You, you, you know, all of those people and all those committees are just wrapped up in my wife and myself. Right, right. So you can, you can, you pick the right thing. You say, this is the one. Nobody else is telling us what to do. And that's not to say that, you know, our, our good employees that we depend on and their taste buds, they go, we think, what do you think? But it's, not, but it's not just driven by bottom line price. No, not at all. Exactly. And that's why if someone like him says, well, our product is better or it tastes better for these different reasons and people want to know why, that's a big reason why. They don't have to kowtow to a bottom line price. They can make it work within the, the budget construct of what they've already done. And that's, I gather that with anybody that's making things on a little bit smaller scale that you have the advantage if you want to take advantage of. So, and you're taking advantage of that. Yes. That's fantastic. Yes. That's, that, changes, that changes everything with the quality of a product. It does. You found a specific yeast that's We did. Work. And so we pitch it in the top here. Okay. And we wait. Right. And we wait about, only about a week, actually. So in that waiting, yeast has one mission in life, and that's to eat sugar. So it's in a perfect place here. And with all that eating, it produces two things. It produces carbon dioxide, which just boils off into the atmosphere harmlessly, okay. and alcohol. Right. So it's the yeast eating the sugar that gives us the alcohol. So we've gone from Mother Nature's starch, we've converted it to sugar, mm -hmm. and then the yeast helps us and converts that to alcohol. Okay. And so up to this point, we've actually been a brewery because we've just made beer. We call it right. distiller's beer because it has a long way to go. Yeah. But after about a week, we're looking at about an 8% by volume ABV. Then we take our, our pipes and our pumps and our hoses and we pump it and we pump it over to the hot side. Here we are at the hot side. Uh, we call it the hot side, obviously, because our six stills live on this wall. And I love that word because it takes people back to Kentucky moonshine. Doesn't it ever? Yeah, right. Not but a, that's not what a bad, it is. Not a bad place to go. Well, I mean, some of our, a lot of original information actually came from some moonshiners, some of good old boys. Right. That helped me in a lot of different areas. Because just because they might have not been doing legally doesn't mean they didn't know what they were doing. Very true. <laughs> it was a lot of knowledge and it's shared. Um, we have three stills, uh, types of stills, and actually, our very first type uh, that we're going to talk about because of the liquid now coming from the fermenter actually goes into a modern day version of the old pot still. So a pot still is just a vessel with fire under it and uh, some material inside that's been fermented. This definitely is authentic because this is Bubba's barrels. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met Bubba. But yeah, okay. I've met a barrel. Bubba. That's our first job is to now uh, steal the alcohol out of the water. Right. And we do that by boiling. And lucky for us, alcohol boils before water does. So it's the alcohol, really, the vapor, that is trying to escape from the still first. So as long as we don't boil these tanks to a temperature that boils water, uh, we can boil the alcohol and not boil the water. And all the steam would be contained inside, and it comes over and okay. hits the condensers, turns back to liquid. 
and voila, we have our first distillation. We call it the strip. It's more alcoholic than it was over in the fermenters. So but not far enough. Well, yeah. well, not far enough. The bad news is it, we had 200. We started with 200 gallons, yeah. and out of that 200 gallons, we're only going to get 50. Okay, but the good news is it was 8 percent by volume over there, and now we're looking at 50 proof or 25 percent. So that makes sense. Makes sense. It's going in the right direction, but we have a, a longer way to go. Right, right. So then what's after this point? Uh, another distillation, which we call the spirit run. Okay, Come on let's down. Let's do that. There will be a tank connected to this big column. Okay. That's our vodka still. This is the whiskey still. This is they are, These are both fractionating columns. The official name of it is a fractionating compound column still. No one remembers that, but uh, they just refer to it as a modern column still. Right. The kind of funny thing about that is there's nothing modern at all about it. No, when it says fractionating, in other words, is there truly inside divisions? Yes, in each there one? are copper plates. And, and now, do they open and close? Uh, no, the vapor passes through them. Through them. But when you're passing through copper, will that add, actually add some flavor or some change? It flavor? not only adds a great deal of flavor, okay. but also, uh, which they didn't realize in the beginning, back okay. when this was invented, believe okay. it or not, in 1831, by oh, the way. Wow. Um, and of course, it was invented by an Irishman. Uh -huh. I just have to get that in there. Copper has an affinity for sulfides, and sulfides, you can think of sulfides as a headache. Uh, it's a naturally occurring group of chemicals that occur both in fermentation and distillation. Next time, look at your wine bottle and it says on the side, warning, contains sulfides. So they're naturally occurring, but the copper has a magnetic attraction to sulfides. The copper as well helps attract and sticks on the copper, thereby turning the copper black after use. And we have to clean it. Oh, every time. Mm -hmm. All right, so we, each one's got a plate going all the way up. Yes. And, and instead of just going straight up the chute or, and doing that, what's the game? What, what happens? What happens because of all those divisions? Ah, okay. We were, when we stripped it, it was uh, 50 proof or 25%. Mm -hmm. Now we, when we distill it for the second time in the spirit run, yeah. by the time that vapor gets to the top of the column, we're hitting 190 proof or over. So there's the benefit. Uh, it's not just increasing the flavor, but it's also increasing the proof. I'm surprised at that point that all the colleges don't come down here and try to well, get the fry. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's punch bowl time. Yeah, right. Uh, and it will put your lips to sleep. I'm me. sure they would. Yes. We have to be very careful of it at that. At that yeah, uh, yeah. So now you've got to, so when it goes through that process, now do you have to bring it down or what are you doing with it? Yes. Uh, first of all, we have to throw some of it away because the very first stuff that comes over, of course, is deadly poison. Really? Acetones, methanols, oh, propanols, right, it's pulling all that butanols, out. yes. Ah, right. Yeah, so they, they're, they're called the four shots and they go straight down the drain. No kidding. Yes. I never heard that terminology, but that's good yes. to know. The four Very shots. Very good to know because people still die every year from drinking the wrong stuff if they're running a still. So that's why those kind of things that occurred because they never really got all that out of the That's pot. correct. Well, cheaper liquor will have more of the beginnings and the end of the runs. They want to keep it because volume is the name of the game. Right. Luckily, that's not our ticket here. Quality right. is the name of the game. Is there possibly products on the market that are less expensive? They could buy a vodka or something. And it's definitely, I mean, it's price-wise less expensive on the retail shelf. That possibly could have more of that in it? There's no question. There's no question. Yeah. How does... I mean, as far as I'm, I, but, I know. But, Maybe I never looked hard enough, but I've never flipped the bottle around to the back side and, and looked at it and said, it contains this much acetone and this well, it's much. Not, we're never going to say that. They're never going to say this. It's going to be vodka. Have. It's going to be vodka because by vodka, it meets the government's definition of vodka. It's, it's clear, it's odorless, so it's tasteless, not, they and don't it's, have to stay it comes over at 190 proof. Okay, that would be the craft level's dilemma of explaining their better product and things. They almost have to visually explain I mean, it's better to do it with a video because at least a lot of people could watch it at the same time right and learn that but most people i didn't know that i didn't know that i thought the government might actually do you know have some kind of stipulations of not having these kind of things in it but there's certain things they just don't they leave it up to the manufacturer to figure it out the consumer doesn't know that uh, most consumers don't yeah you guys i know i'm pointing to the sound and camera here but do you guys know that did you know that i'm bad you're a bad boy <laughs> yeah i did not know but as sure as an eye opener isn't it but yeah, I, that would be I, my I, was jaw dropping. I wonder why i had a headache the next day you know or something like that better the better the whiskey or better things and things that are taken out so yours obviously you go through these steps to get rid of all that stuff absolutely and I, you're cutting I, it as you said the head and the tail very off. deeply 
how much do you lose in this in this process? Well, I would say out of a, out of a hundred gallons now going through the spirit still uh, yeah. for the we're going to get about sixty gallons that are okay. That forty percent is significant cut. That to a lot of people is their margin plus. Right, that's a big deal. But you're getting good product. The good product that's left is sixty percent and it goes where? We filter it. So now our vodka at 170 aggregate proof uh, is going to be filtered. So it's still no playing around stuff. No, it will put your lips to sleep okay. very quickly. Okay. And if you hold it in your mouth long enough, it will enter your bloodstream, whether right. you like it or not. So right. you have to be very careful. How do you know it's 170 proof? Because we have little things that float and tell us. Right. This is a hydrometer. It's measuring the proof of the liquid. Alcohol, pure alcohol weighs, well, very pure alcohol, I should say, weighs 6.9 pounds for every gallon. Water weighs 8.3 pounds for every gallon. So this little guy is weighted to float at a certain level and as the proof either increases or decreases, it is gonna float at different levels because either the liquid is more dense or less dense. So our 170 proof vodka now is gonna go through this thing. It will always vary a little bit. I got you. Uh, one week it'll be 168 and one okay. week it'll oh, be Oh, but not that much. Right, because I know where it's going to end up. Cause, oh, because that's what I was wondering. That and will you matter. Still, I'm sure you've got that, that spot you're aiming for. That by target. government by government approval. <laughs> yeah, stamp by oh, government approval. So it you, will be 80 proof. So you have to have that because you've already stated that your product is 80 it's proof. It's stated on the bottle. Right, and now, you've already created your labels and had that approved. Absolutely. Just like a food product has those. Right, but I, I have to make a little informational thing here. Our vodkas and our gins, we proof to a number. Right. So vodka, we proof to 80 proof. Mm -hmm. Gins, maybe because it was a little more traditional in, in England, uh, we proof to 90 proof. Our whiskeys uh, are proofed to taste, not a number. So that means that Dana and I, every batch of bourbon or rye whiskey or single malt that comes, comes through the still and is ready for bottling, we are tasting it and going, oh, this is it right here. Don't go any lower. This mm -hmm. is, we don't want to lose any of this flavor. We'll take a little bit of more of the heat, mm -hmm. but we don't want to lose the flavor. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have to hand label all of the proof and the alcohol by volume on the bottle. So some of our specialty liquors are well over a hundred. Gotcha. Cause it, there's the flavor mm -hmm. there again. It's not the volume, right? Right. We make right. more money if it's 80 proof. So $6,000 version of Brita, a filter that's filled with about $1,000 worth of charcoal. It's probably the best filtering material on the planet. It really does change flavors for the better. We get about a year and a half out of this. Oh, that's not bad. Uh, we didn't take filtration seriously at all in the beginning. Like I say, you know, the learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, but as we progressed, and the people we talked to and the things we tasted and, That's what and I was the stories ask you. we heard. You're right, exactly. The, the, who, st who steered you to using well, charcoal? Well, actually, uh, stories like Jack Daniels. Uh, in the very, very beginning, Jack Daniels planted their own forest. They planted a forest of, of um, sugar maple, as far as I understand. And when the trees got tall enough, they started cutting them down. And every year since, they uh, cut some down, not all, and they burn it and they make their own activated carbon. So we hear stories about that. And we go, boy, we better, we better. Yeah, they're not playing they, around, yeah. it must be important. They have their own forest for heaven's yeah, sake. So, right. gee whiz, maybe there's something to this. Right, right. So right. we start looking into it and then start experimenting and going, boy, this is better. This mm -hmm. does taste better. Mm -hmm. uh, so it matters, filtration mm -hmm. matters. How much do you product do you lose at this point? None. So, oh. Well, a couple of gallons. Yeah, maybe. but not, not nothing substantial. Right, I can put two or 300 gallons through here and I'm, you know, Two or three gallons sort of so no disappear in the pipes. No big deal on that. No. Oh, okay. So now you're filtering it for how long? It takes about a half a day. So the process is physically, I'm watching it. You're you're opening up this tap down here. You're putting it in something, right? And then after you do that and you empty this thing out, then you run it back through again. Around and around. Round and Four around. Four times. After we make it cold. We make it very, very cold. Oh, you have to make it cold first? Yes. Well, we don't have to, but we do. And what's because what's, what's the chill advantage? filtering? Um, you can just imagine all these little molecules that represent bad flavors and bad taste. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if it's in a warm liquid, mm -hmm. they go into more solution and they can dissolve and hide sure. better. Sure. But if we make it cold, they kind of have to huddle together okay. and they're easier to catch. Ah. So. Uh, 
That's now, I don't know. I am term. not a chemist. Okay. <laughs> but that's kind of how I explain it. That's how I visualize that's it visualize. in my mind. Yeah, that's, that's a good, good picture. Yeah. <laughs> After you finish here, it goes into where? It goes into the middle room okay. and it gets bottled. Okay. And then uh, our distributor drives up out front and we take our forklift and load up the truck and it goes on down to Phoenix to our distributor. Oh, all right. And so you got you to gotta set the distributor down there and that distributor then helps take the product. Disperses it throughout the state. So it means that we're in Bebmo and Total Wine and Costco uh, and uh, Safeway oh, and really? Fries. Yes. If somebody wanted something that they didn't see in a store, how would they then be able to get it? Well, we, um, of course, we sell here. Okay, we are so. open to the public uh, three afternoons a week. But you can also ship, right? Am we correct? we ship as well. We ship individual bottles. Okay. They can go. People can go right to the website. Plus, you do tours. We do tours. And you do them. I do them. Two, three, and four o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, Saturdays, and then uh, one tour on Sunday at twelve thirty. And how long does the tour last? May maybe thirty minutes or so. And the idea is is that before someone just sits down and has a whole series of shots. We like them to have a little bit of an idea of what went into it and the fact that it really happens in this building and that we really care about what we're doing. Right. So uh, it makes it also more under, fun. Yeah, understand the product. Yeah. What we want to know really when we talk about aging is that they'll use certain barrels and there's a certain amount of time that they age it. Think about scotch, okay? They'll always put in, but bang, that's aged for X amount of years. That's like a selling point, right? How important is that aging time really once you go through all these other processes? Well, that it's, it's very important. Okay. And, and what's most important really is the wood. And the go-to wood around the world now is American white oak. It is sought after in Japan and Croatia and Indonesia, the, uh, all of the distilleries around the world. Many distilleries buy used barrels from the distilling in, you know, institutions here in the United States. Now, most especially, that process is used by people making single malt. Okay. So even Scotland comes here and buys American white oak okay. uh, used barrels because barley doesn't like to be on new wood. It's going to be on for a very long time. And so being on new wood, it's, it's too long. Going back hundreds of years, okay. back when sailing ships were going up and down in Europe okay. and the Atlantic, people would jump in their little sailboats and there's big ships and they would go down to Portugal okay. with an empty boat. Right. They would buy old sherry barrels that were used and done with, okay. Okay, empty, mm -hmm. and they would sail back to Scotland and then they would make their Scotch whiskey, their single malt, and they would uh, use those barrels and put it up on the wall for as long as 25 years. And that started the process. Now, instead of getting old Oloroso sherry barrels, they're using mostly American white oak that's been used for other things. American white oak is the go-to wood. French oak, uh, of course, is still the most popular for wine. Wine has uh, uh, likes the tannin that's in French oak. It helps the life of the grape in the bottle and all of that, but whiskey does not like tannin. It has a tendency to bitter. So tannin is what? Just to explain. It's, it's, a, it's a chemical in the wood right. that is a flavor and, a, and it has an effect. American white oak has a very low percentage of tannin. Okay. And so that's why it's... So that's a huge plus. It's a huge plus for whiskey. In the beginning, we looked and looked and looked for all kinds of different barrels that were used for other products. It was tough to get some you know, used barrels, especially on a consistent basis right. so therefore our consistency was you know going to be in question okay. so Dana and I decided that we would infuse our own wood with our own wine and actually put it under pressure and, in, and influence the wood with different flavors that we like we can also experiment and use different cherries or wines or rum in different different processes to get different flavors. Infusing is, just imagine you take a stick and you have a barrel of wine or a bottle of wine, you drop the stick in and you let it sit there. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, 
And it, eventually it, you pull the stick it, out. And eventually you pull the stick out. But it, but it captured some flavor. It has some flavor in it. Of that. Okay, so that's, it's but, uh, not to make it sound like any more than it is. Right. It's just, it is flavoring the wood. So, so what you do is you make a determination or have made a determination over time, how much is enough of the drop of what you're dropping in there and how long is enough. And some of the wood is, is infused into different wines or sherries and some of the wood is just newly charred or second hand. So we do all of those processes that were done in the old days in Scotland, do it in a, in a new, in a new way here. Rye whiskey was sort of the stepchild for a very, very long time when it right. came to whiskey. Right. Now, when I was a kid, uh, herding cows and uh, being a cowboy, yeah. uh, the old timers were drinking, you know, rot gut rye and chewing tobacco. And of course, I tried to do all that stuff too. But it was stuff like old Overholt or something, just horrible, horrible stuff. Right. And so I grew up thinking that rye whiskey was bad. As a young adult, I never drank rye. Most of my friends never drank rye. Right. When it came to looking for a benchmark for a rye, we didn't really have one. So we just started experimenting from the ground up. I can tell you, our bourbon actually, we did find a benchmark that we liked, but for the rye, I didn't have one. So now you feel you've got one. I, I feel that I, this and is it. What makes it different? What? Well, first of all, very high in rye. U.S. government designates rye whiskey as must be a minimum of 51% rye grain. Oh. And ours a, is 95. That's a lot of room. It's a lot of room. That's a lot of room to do whatever you want. Right. And you found that staying on the top end percentage like that is, is going to give you the best product. That's, that's what we feel. Tell me about this Robert's Rye, a little bit different, and why is it different? Why did well, you make this? First of all, it's 100 proof, uh, and it's the only whiskey. And the other one is? Um, well, let's see. Uh, today, it's 92 proof. This is the only whiskey we proof to a number. Okay. As like I said, the, the other whiskeys we, we proof to taste. The story behind this is if you recognize the fellow that's on the label, uh, it's Robert Mitchum, the actor. Uh, his son, James Mitchum, uh, lives here in Prescott. Oh, really? And he's good friends of ours. Okay. He comes by a lot, and we have he has great stories. Okay. Growing up, of course, as a, as a son of a child star, and then and then uh, becoming a star himself. He gave us permission. He and his brother gave us permission to use his father's image. Jim actually took me back to Tennessee and introduced me to his his uh, good old boy distiller who taught uh, me a lot. We've depended on Jim to uh, give us some some very important guidance when it came to rye whiskey. It's really great, and because the higher proof it allows more of the flavor. It, right. You just have to be willing to take the higher octane. In the beginning. In the beginning. You can't, you can't always go to start a story with in the beginning. Um, there was darkness. <laughs> yeah, right. And then we came out with this great <laughs> bourbon. Right. <laughs> I had no comparison, and since I wasn't a, a bourbon fan, we had thousands of dollars worth of liquor in the front office with bottles from every make and model. Yeah. Tasting to see what do we like, who do we want to be. I was worried about being the head distiller and not liking bourbon. That's like a heresy. Until I drank Blanton's. I had never heard of Blanton. They have many different grades, some very, very pricey. But I really liked the flavor. And I, I said to myself, okay, and all of us sitting around the table, that's who we want to be. The day that we were pouring this and someone tasted it and said, geez, this reminds me of Blanton. It was the day I just, <laughs> I could have just, quit right then. <laughs> yeah. So over time, it's grown from there. Of course, it could, sure. couldn't help as we change our distilling practices, sure. which we have over, over the years, right. and our aging practices. Blanton's was a great start for us. Okay. And now I like I like our bourbon better than Blanton's. But, right. it, but there, we needed a benchmark what, of something. And kind. what makes you like it better? What's the difference? It was sweet enough. It was spicy enough. I think the main difference between rye whiskey and bourbon whiskey is I, I think of rye as being spicy yeah and I think of bourbon being sweeter right so uh, that's, that's how a, I think of bourbon too, yeah sweeter. things can be too sweet and things can be too much corn right. and then then I'm not fan I'm not a fan of corn whiskey which is a much higher percentage of corn it's a, above 75 percent would would be a considered a corn so whiskey. what is what what are you putting in what grain this are you is, using for this this is this is 74 percent corn 74 so it's very corn. close okay. to being a corn whiskey and what else is in it uh it will rye so okay. we're we are our bourbon is a rye bourbon so bourbon uh is generally either a rye bourbon or a weeded bourbon and uh our bourbon happens to be uh, a rye bourbon it's 21 percent rye okay because we like the flavor so 21 <laughs> 74 or missing a couple of points in there. Well, there's uh, four points that would be barley. We, oh, the we barley. Got, got to get the malt in there for the enzymes. enzymes. So that always is 
Yes. Plain. It's, it's, always, always, it's plain. always a factor. We have our Western Sage Gin. I just love looking at it. I, it well, it's a good looking, it's a good <laughs> it's looking a great label. It's another label by Maverick. Uh, and Dana actually had the input. She told Maverick what she wanted. And so it, it depicts a lot of different spices and uh, botanicals that actually go into making the, the gin itself. A friend of ours who was a metal sculptor up the road came by and he said, he had a garbage bag and he said, can I throw this in your dumpster? And we said, well, well sure, go ahead. And then I said, well, what is it? He said, oh, it's sage. I, it's growing out of house and home. I hate it. It's in the way in my garden. Well, and sure. I said, fine, throw it away. And then, I, and, then he, and then he said, geez, maybe Danny would like it for some kind of flavorings. And I said, nah, I don't think so. I, I'd never heard of sage being used in anything that I can think of. But I said, maybe you better leave it. And we'll ask Dana. Three months later, we won the silver medal uh, at the LA International Spirit Competition for our Western Sage Gin. Boom. So it goes, they tasted that and went, woo, that's different. Yeah. So it goes, you never know who's going to walk in your door and, you know, change your life. My understanding, of course, is we credit the English. We are 90 proof because we think of it as a traditional English proof. Putting a little gin in something was always, you know, if you were English, you put a little gin in things. It, it was helpful against that disease. This Jenny, is a, basically a daily drink for some people. Gin and for, tonic. For a bet. long time. Forever. Right. Almost. So what is a Meyer lemon so people understand? Meyer is lemon is a, is a cross between a Eureka lemon and a mandarin orange. It's what's very it? sour. What's it? Oh, it's very <laughs> sour. <laughs> the fragrance is very identifiable in a Meyer lemon. Okay. They grow in both hemispheres. So okay. when they're not in season in the northern hemisphere, we get them from New Zealand. Yeah. What we do is we, we take our lemons okay. and we stuff them into a metal type basket that has holes in it. Gotcha. And we boil vodka. Okay. And the vapor rises and it goes through that basket. Whatever's in that basket, it's gonna pick up that flavor. But it has a very nice fragrance and a, a very subtle flavor of is Meyer there, lemon. Is there a bottle that's open? Yeah. Yes. All right, so this is the Meyer lemon. Yeah, it's just on the top or something. It's just there, which is, makes it nice. Cuts the edge off or something. Am I correct? I, I think so. Okay. You know, if you drink, I don't know, any alcohol or anything, especially if it's your first shot or your first amount at that particular moment, there's a little bit more of a heavy, uh, a sharp taste, or a little bit more of a burn or whatever. But I notice it just kind of takes that that initial part away. Because I could tell you from other brand. Can I mention another brand? That oh, yeah, well, it's fine with brand? me. Yeah. Like Absolute, which is a pretty yeah. good vodka. And it's yeah. well known. Yes. And everybody knows it, right? Yes. And my wife drinks it. And this is better. <laughs> well, I, I try. <laughs> yeah. Let me try that again. Actually, anybody else want to try? You want to try this? Austin? Okay. Can you shoot our sound guy here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is Austin. So what you do, I just want you to taste a little bit, okay? And then let it go, let it sit. You see how it cuts the edge off? And then it's not as much of a burn, right? Yeah. And give yourself just a little few seconds. And then do it again, and you're, it's like there's no edge at all. Yeah, that was... Ooh. Nice, isn't it? That's good. It is. And we're not pandering here, guys. That's pretty damn good. Our camera guys is going after it now. Okay, and that's the initial. Okay. Pretty so smooth. smooth. That's right. Wow. That second sip is just. I've actually never had a smooth podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's very smooth. I love it. When I'm looking at this vodka, are you taking this vodka and then infusing it with your Meyer lemon? Yes. So so first we have our the standard vodka, which we work tirelessly to make it the best tasting vodka that anyone can taste. So it's a combination of French wheat and Polish potato, and then it's distilled again. Your potato percentage is much lower, am I correct? 20%. I like the flavor of the wheat. I am not a fan of corn. I'm not a fan of corn when it's used in vodka. But I had this idea that wouldn't it be sort of interesting to maybe just cut that top edge of, the, of that vodka flavor that people think of in a, not a good way to add a little of the potato, thinking that it, and the mouthfeel is different with potato vodka. We start with our normal vodka and then we actually distill it a third time and that's how we in, infuse the flavor of the lemon. So on that third So time. it's a third distillation on top of something that's already 
perfect as far as I'm concerned. Right. So it's becoming even better and then it's picking up a flavor. The Pomelo, we have some dear friends that started a restaurant down in uh, down in the valley in Phoenix. Okay. Pomelo restaurant, and there are two of them, one in North wow. Phoenix and one in Scottsdale. We made this vodka for them. Uh, Pomelo is a big yellow citrus. Big like your hands are? You're out there like well, a basketball. Okay. That big. No kidding. It's very big. It looks like a grapefruit, but it isn't a grapefruit. Okay. It's, a, it's a Southeast Asian citrus fruit. It has pink meat and it's very mild. It, for being so big, you'd think it would be harsh or whatever, but it's extremely mild and uh, it makes a wonderful infusion. And let me confound you a little bit further. Who knew that gin is just a flavored vodka? The same infusing process that goes to make these flavors. Right. But everyone in the book said you have to peel the white pith away, that it was going to be bitter. We put the whole thing in. Okay. And, uh, and then Chop of course, it up or? A little bit, okay. into quarters maybe. Okay. Uh, and then of course we add the most important thing that makes it legally gin right. and not just a flavored vodka is the juniper berry. Okay. So the juniper berry has to go in there to, to be make, gin. To be gin. Uh, okay. Several times a year, a few times a year, we will make a special edition. It's usually a whiskey. This has a fun story and it sounds like we're making it up to be marketable, but it actually, Justin, who's our main IT guy and drink designer and our head bartender, Justin and I were in the back and we were working away and we have some uh, racks of old, old barrels uh, and we were cleaning them up and we ran across a five gallon barrel that there was a label on it that was two years old. And on the label it said that we had put rye, our rye whiskey in there two years prior. And we had- And it was still in there. It was still in there and I had completely forgotten about it. Okay. Now the thing about that is five gallon barrels are very, very fast. They age very fast because the proportion of wood to liquid is so much greater the smaller the vessel. And I thought for sure that that, uh, that, that rye was gonna be ruined. Well, we opened it and it was, uh, of course, the angel's share. The, uh, the angels got their share. We put in five gallons and by the time it came out two years later, we had about a little less than three gallons. So, so. there's a lot of wasted angels flying around. Yeah, the, yeah, but it was so great. We blended it with some of our other whiskeys and we came up with our special edition number six. And we were lucky enough to get only 80 of these bottles. That was starting, I think, last November maybe. That's it. And there's like, is there five left? Five or six, just a handful. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Let's say somebody buys this and they put it on their shelf and they come back 10 years later. Is it still drinkable? Uh, whiskey is dead. Wine is alive. So it's dead. It's just like gasoline in a can. Exactly. It's, it's not going to change. Not going to change. It's not gonna as age. long as the cork is good. Oh. Old brandies right. and things have been discovered in sunken, sh sunken treasure sh ships right. and all they, that. They, that's all real. They drink them. Oh, yeah. Well, they probably Maybe. sell them, but yeah, right, that's true too. <laughs> yeah. it's a little worth a little bit more that way. Right. Somebody could have this sitting around for a while too and still. You bet. It. In fact, a lot of people just buy it because uh, because our double gold medal winner was a was and number two was a double gold medal winner at the American Distilling Institute show in New Orleans. Wow. And Dana and I got to go to New Orleans and and get the medals, and it was great. Oh, so we won cool. in two categories, and uh, so those bottles they they sell. The last one sold, I think, for $500. That's some serious jack. It pays the electric bill. That's right. That's right. Um, this is this, when we do have music inside. This is this is where we we have it. So we we've had as many as 10-piece horn bands in here, All right. um, single folk singers, and rock and roll, and country western, and jazz, and you name it. But you come and hear a band. Yeah. It's Friday night. Okay. And that starts at six o'clock and usually runs till nine. So. Okay. We we and really that's beyond, so that is beyond your normal hours. That is beyond our normal normal hours. Okay. Uh, however, we're not the neighborhood bar, so we we're not open till midnight with music. Right. People can get home at a reasonable time. So when it, somebody comes, listen to some music, they can order whatever drinks that you have available during your other time. Am yes, I correct. Absolutely. And also, I noticed that you have a menu. We wanted to keep it simple, but Smart. but I'll tell you. Dana and I went, when we were taking tours to see what other people did, we yeah. were so uh, underwhelmed right, um, right. about what people call the cheese plate for yeah. too much money. I, so I have to say the cheese plates, the gals go overboard. Oh, really? This used to be the grain room. Um, okay. And this would, was piled with grain. Now we have the grain stacked up against the other wall there uh, because it just made more sense uh, to change the entrance. It's an opportunity to show some local art. People can buy little bottles if they want to uh, take them home. Or oh, gift as, sets. As gifts, yes. 
Yeah, that's cool. I like the little bottles too because they're yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, they're cool. If you kind of want to try our rye versus our bourbon or our gin, uh, it's a great way to take home more than one flavor. People really love sitting out here um, for a, a chat, perhaps without the, the when the music's playing. We have a lot of people who come here and play games. So we have. Uh, games I recognize and, and games that I don't you mean recognize. Like board games? I mean like board games. We have many people coming in with board games. It makes it fun. Yeah. I like to see people playing away. We've won 26 medals to date. Okay. Inter in, and that's international. That's against anybody and everybody. The, the, we only enter the big shows. That's a stack. That's LA International, uh, San Francisco International, American Distilling Institute, uh, Washington Spirit Cup competition. Okay. Those are the main ones. Um, so they're there not are a few playing, others. They're not playing around. No, no, we're up against yeah, Seagram's and right. Johnny Walker and that's you great. That's great. Yeah. And we we win every year. Uh, last year, our rye got a silver medal from Sunset Magazine. Okay. Um, and we had three silver medals last year for our single malt, our hundred proof rye, and our bourbon. These judges who are much better at tasting than I am, I, yeah. I want their tasting notes. I, I want their opinions sure. so that we can grow. And yeah, because be they're, they're busy checking products out from all over the Absol world. Absolutely. All right, so we're at the Thumb Butte Distillery and we're tying things up here and I'm sure you've seen a lot and learned a lot, but this is the most special one and you can't buy this one, sorry to say, but this is their dog, Blue, and it's female. How old is your dog? Six. She's six. And she's super sweet and her fur is very soft. So when you do come here and you want to either purchase something or sit down and just have something to drink and get something to eat, you can just come here and pet the dog too. Because it's, yeah. it's, yeah, because it, uh, it just makes you feel good. So you have, you have one more thing you want to uh, show us? Strange things happen in the back in the back room. Okay. Um, Dana was doing some research and kept reading about barrel aged gin and, and wanted to make some. I thought that it was just a, a, too much of a fad. Dana is always right. So what we did is we took some of our Western Sage gin and we found an old rum barrel that we had had from long ago. And we put the, uh, put the gin in the barrel and we waited, uh, we're now waiting 80 days in the small barrel. The gin comes out um, looking with some color from the wood and a very interesting flavor is somewhere between a little bit of the rum and uh, a little bit of the wood and we couldn't help ourselves we call it gin rummy oh man <laughs> <laughs> i want to thank jim and dana and all the other people that got on and off the camera from thumb butte distillery and i think we learned a ton here about about distilling and some stuff i never knew before so i, I really enjoyed myself and i hope you did too jim and uh, I want to thank you. You notice a dog comes in right on cue. Yeah, she's so cute. <laughs> You're cute, you know it. That's, a, that's the problem right there. Yeah. So yeah. you know what to do. Yeah. You've already got everybody kind of won over. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for well, coming thank you. today. Thank you, I appreciate it.